What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, Super Producer Brandon Newman, Isaiah out in the desert. My father, Mike Golick Sr., not with us today here. He is en route to Dublin, Ireland. He has had a travel nightmare of the last couple of days. So lift my father up in prayer so that he doesn't snap on some poor worker whose job is not actually affecting his outcome here. To help us out in the meantime... We welcome back to the program one of our dear friends currently operating from Parts Unknown right now, but announcements coming soon. Jason Fitz. Fitzy, what's going on, man? I'm just living the dream. I really realized I blew it here, Mike. I, I was supposed to be like one of those 80s sitcoms, like looking off and then I could do the whole, hey, like we could have done the whole intro to Full House here. Could have been a thing. I blew it. That's my fault, man. I, I let you down already. You you know what? We'll work on it by the time we get to the ending so we can do the freeze frame with you where we just scroll text below you telling about what happens in your future. So decide okay. what you want your future to be, and then we'll try and make that happen for you by the end with like, this will be your everlasting love playing in the background. I'm all in on this, by the way. The, the future is inevitable. I just want to be adopted by your parents so I can become a Golic. That's really all in, uh, that's that's all I'm looking for in my life. That's it. My, my life goals. Oh. My God. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen because I have to deal with enough of you as is. And the thought of us being siblings is, I mean, my family I'd be your big you brother. Too. I'd my be brother your is... big brother. Oh, you'd have to respect my thought. That'd be amazing. I can tell you as the current big brother in this family, no one respects my authority. So you'd be barking up the wrong tree there, brother man. Uh, we got a great show for you guys today. As always, download, subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us that five-star rating. Uh, check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel as well. We got an interview with Chip Kelly, UCLA's head football coach, coming up today. Pretty insightful stuff. They got a quarterback competition going on there. They are waiting to name that starter. We also got into some stuff just about the changes in college football that Chip Kelly has been around both on and off the field. So very excited to share that one with you guys. But before we get to any of that, so we realized something in the pre-show meeting, and I now feel the need to apologize on his behalf. Because last night, something happened that had not happened in a very, very long time. The Baltimore Ravens lost a preseason football game last night. Their first in 24 preseason games that they had won. 24 straight come screeching to a halt. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe the this is a great sign for the Washington Commanders who were able to put a stop to this preseason win streak. They played their starters for an unreasonably long time against a lot of Ravens backup and really seemed to want this one. Maybe this is just, you know, math finally mathing. This is sort of an insane streak in a, you know, on the backs of usually backup football players. But no, no, no. Instead, we find out this morning it's because Jason Fitz finally decided to start gambling on preseason football and tried to go with the surest bet, blue chip stock in the Baltimore Ravens in the preseason, and it all comes screeching to a heart. Jason, do you feel at least a little bad? I, I feel like the gambling gods are sending me a message, Mike, because here's the thing. Last year on college football, I'm going to be honest, I did pretty well. Like, you know, you and I work a lot in that space. I tried to use my expertise a little bit to to actually sit down and say, what do I think? Not just, you know, a late night Saturday night had too much to drink sort of bets. Like I actually really put thought into it. I was doing pretty darn well. Then we got into the NFL playoffs, did really well in the NFL playoffs. In the Super Bowl, oh man, I was on fire. So I ended the year, the, the football season, feeling like a golden god that could not be touched. And then I decided I was just going to give it all back over the course of the NBA. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a little time off. I'm going to take a little time off. I'm going to I'm going to ease my way back in when we get to football season. Took that time off all summer. Came in last night, and I was like, you know what? This is the perfect way to ease my way back in. Ravens money line can't lose, won't lose, did lose. So there we go. It's a sign from from the gods that like maybe I took I took for granted the winnings of last year. I gave myself too much credit instead of the gods enough credit. And now all of a sudden, I'm right back where I started. So I don't know. Like now I'm scared for the whole season. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Uh, the gambling gods are cruel and they do demand sacrifice every once in a while. I just didn't realize it was going to be the Baltimore Ravens' beloved win streak. And I would say you should feel the worst out of anybody, but that would probably uh, be a distinction that goes to new Washington Commanders owner Josh Harris, who went up in the booth last night and had one of the most embarrassing handshake fumbles. Do we have that video? Yeah, you know, it's preseason, but we'd still like to win. Yeah, I mean, you're no, no injuries, stranger. But... You're no stranger to 
uh, professional sports teams, managing general partner of the Devils. You're no stranger to. You're no stranger to. You're no stranger to. That courtesy of the ESPN Monday Night Football booth as Josh Harris, the new owner of the Washington Commanders, one of the part owners of the Sixers, is up in the booth with Troy and Joe Buck and mistakes a Joe Buck hand gesture for an attempted handshake, tries to grab it. Troy Aikman cannot contain his joy on the other side as that old NFC East rivalry comes out in the strangest place. So Fitz, while you definitely messed up, at least you didn't mess up that bad and on camera. This though, this this proves why one thing I you know about me, I'm a hugger, right? Like anybody that's hung out with me at all knows that I like to just hug, right? Th this is why the hug avoids this inevitable awkward handshake moment because you announce the hug. Like anybody that's a hugger starts by saying, "Hey, I'm a hugger, bring it in," right? Like nobody just randomly grabs you and hugs you, especially in today's society. So by me having to announce that I'm a hugger, uh, I'm widening my arms to embrace you to bring you in, you know where I'm going. It avoids this whole awkwardness. Like, he, you know, maybe it's time to just embrace the hug across all of society so that there's a very clear line in the sand on what the intent is for the whole way. Like, I think my hug approach should now get a little more respect from you, Mike. Your hug approach, and I heard the Dan Levitard show when Dominique Foxworth was on the other day, going through the politics of DAP how to negotiate the angle on DAP coming into a handshake, especially when you're negotiating with a stranger. And it's a lot more subtleties. It's arm angle, it's hand position, it's general demeanor walking up. And Jason, to your point, while I, I think your excessive hugging has been a topic of conversation for a long time and it's controversial in some circles, it definitely does send a clearer message that having to try and negotiate is someone coming in at like a 30 degree angle here, is someone coming in straight on with the handshake. All of these are a little bit more difficult than you just screaming in like a tiny pterodactyl at any given moment. By the way, though, as you say that, I've now realized that part of the reason you're a good dapper is because, and I say that with so much love, is because your body language makes it very clear. You don't leave a question. Like you bring one arm out to an angle that makes it very clear it's going to be a slap, not a hold, right? It's a pap. And then the, the, the like, you've left only one angle for all of this to happen. You've made it clear. There's a little bit here on Joe Buck, who's doing, I don't know, like Broadway hands where he's going side to side and he's doing the little like, ah! thing on the side i mean maybe maybe it's just like you don't think that that's what's coming at you and all of a sudden you think there's a handshake going like if he's more clear on all of that maybe there's no accidental handshake Credit to Joe Buck for being the consummate pro, too, because a lot of people would have jumped if all of a sudden you're not expecting your hand to get grabbed midpoint in the broadcast, and all of a sudden you've got another grown man caressing your hand in the middle of that time period. He kept it moving on that. That's a man who's got a lot of reps and a lot of volume of being a pro in the booth, because a lot of people, Jason, I'd imagine you would have flinched. Do, oh, I would have flinched. I would have made a comment, especially if the hand was slimy. There's a lot of breakdown here on the hand. Like, was it sweaty? Is it cold? Like, where is he on it? But also, like, there's this moment. Do you think Joe Buck immediately thought, that's going to be me? Like, because that's realistically where mm -hmm. you and I, you mess that up immediately. Your thought is, okay, I don't, no matter what we do, this is going to take over the World Wide Web tonight, right? Like, I, I feel like he had to know that in his head. Uh, for sure. it's And my dad talks about this all the time, the sinking feeling as a player. And Jason, I'm not sure if you had this in music where you know when you make a mistake in a game and it's bad enough to where, oh, when we're watching that tape on Monday, I am going to get destroyed. I know it in my heart. I know it's coming and you've already got that feeling. This has to be the broadcast version of that where you know the internet's going to run wild with this. So we had this one fear when I was with the band Perry. There was one time that I remember and it didn't, it went off perfectly. But the one time that I was ever truly scared that we would become known for the rest of time for the wrong thing was at the beginning of one of the award shows, I think it was the ACMs, uh, the, the three Perry's, Kimberly, Neil, and Reed, were on what they call a toaster. And that's one of those things that sits under the stage and it blows up and it just set, like, so you, you pop out like toast and you're on stage. And she had to pop out and she was wearing these heels that were like this, that she could barely walk in. And there's three of us in the band that were standing in front of our instrument areas assigned with the, if she falls, help her get up and hope no one notices. So most scared I've ever been before a performance. She nailed it. She landed. And like, we even had to work for hours on landing where her like knees were a little bent. She couldn't lock her knees because she could hurt her. So like there were hours spent on that landing. All I kept thinking the whole time is if she falls, and even if I've done nothing wrong, I will be part of one of the most infamous, terrible moments in award show history. So I was, I was scared of that. But by the way, nailed it. Crowd went nuts. It was, uh, it was perfect. 
Oh my God. All right. So we've all learned about the existence of the toaster on stage. And now I, God, I would have paid anything to just see you. Cause it's all about being in frame for the mistake, right? If you're anywhere around there, you end up on all the shots they use on TMZ on entertainment tonight that end up in people magazine. And there would have been little fiddle boy, Jason Fitz, just trying to help up. But you know what? I'm glad you glad you guys averted that crisis. I'm sorry Joe Buck and company couldn't avert that crisis. I will say, though, the darkest group of people on the internet, the worst human beings on earth, are the ones making fun of the Washington Commanders players for celebrating that win at the end of this preseason game here. I will always go back to the immortal words of my former teammate, Torian Smith, who once scooped and scored on a fumble against Navy, got into the end zone, somersaulted into the end zone, and got asked about it by the media after. And he said, some people say, act like you've been there before. I say, I act like I'm never going back. There are some of the players out on that field that might legitimately never be going back to NFL football. And you're going to deny them the opportunity to stunt all over the Baltimore Ravens, who have won 24 straight preseason games. It might not mean something to you, but last night it meant something to Jason Fitz, who was on the losing end of history and his money and it meant something to those players that all got to that point somehow, some way, and wanted to celebrate when they got the chance there. So don't be the person that gets caught when Jesus comes back making fun of players for enjoying preseason football when it might be their last football. Fitzy, in news outside of the world of just preseason football, though, I feel like the NFL keeps trying to come up with new questions that are going to find the same answer in the conversation around running back value this offseason. As yesterday we got the news that all-pro running back Jonathan Taylor has been given permission by the Indianapolis Colts to seek a trade partner, sources told Adam Schefter at ESPN. Now, the Colts are looking for a pretty steep price tag on this. They want essentially a first-rounder or picks that equal the value of around a first-round pick, but... Jason, for Jonathan Taylor, who's been miffed by his contract situation for about the last month, who is going into the final year of his rookie deal and staring down the potential of the franchise tag next year, all these things that have been common problems for a running back, he is now getting a chance to test some version of the market. We know it's not the open market because he's not a free agent because any team that signs him is also going to deal with the daunting task of knowing he wants an extension and probably doesn't want a cheap one. So... Do you see anything actually getting done here, Jason, or is this just all a lot of noise for him to end up back in Indy? No, I don't think anything's going to get done, but I think even more importantly, as you mentioned, it's about the value he wants, right? Because what we have to remember, I saw several people yesterday saying, oh, the Bills, the Bills should go trade a first-round pick. It'll be the low end of the first round. You go get Jonathan Taylor. You're, it drastically improves your team. Okay, but you have to ask yourself this. There's no team that's going to make a trade for Jonathan Taylor without some sort of an agreement on what a new contract looks like, right? So then you ask yourselves this, is it smart for the Bills to invest a high amount of money at the running back position? And the answer to that is probably no, right? So what's interesting about this is we've looked at Saquon, we've looked at Josh Jacobs, we've looked at Jonathan Taylor, and each time we look at it and say, well, this is the team sort of playing with the economics of the player. I think it's the whole league, and that's what running backs are not realizing right now. If the Raiders decide today to, although they won't, to rescind the franchise tag of Josh Jacobs, again, they would not do that. But if they did, I don't think there's suddenly some huge legendary amount of money coming to Josh Jacobs. I don't think the league values running backs. So what Jonathan Taylor thinks right now is that the Colts don't value him. What I think he's going to find out is at the level he wants to be valued, nobody in the NFL does. And if that's the real situation for running backs that we think exists, all of a sudden things get much more complicated because you can't do that deal without a new contract in place. Yeah, and I think that's a good reminder too that all these situations are slightly different even if it goes back to the same root point. Like you mentioned, we've had an offseason full of a resounding answer about where the league sees running backs, right? You mentioned the Josh Jacobs situation that's still ongoing with your beloved Las Vegas Raiders. We have had Dalvin Cook and Ezekiel Elliott both having to wait pretty deep into camp to sign short-term incentive-laden deals with their respective teams. You had everything that went on this offseason in a number of different instances with the franchise tag. Tony Pollard signing the franchise tag, all of this going on, like every single place we've turned, the answer has turned back to, hey, once you're off your rookie contract, we really start to sort of lose that love that we might have had for you there. And 
to your point with this situation, it's a little bit similar to the Lamar Jackson situation that the Ravens let play out, where now you're dealing with a version of the franchise tag that basically had them trying to get other teams to publicly negotiate for them, and other teams were so scared off because once they sent an offer, the Ravens could just match it, and they had done all the work for you. In this case, it is similar, though, that like you said, Jason, you're not only giving up draft capital, but then you got to give up money. And no team seemed inclined to do that with any of the other number of running backs that were free agents on the market. And while Jonathan Taylor is young, if you're a team that was going to bring him in, like the Bills, let's say, but you didn't want to pay him that money, and then you wanted to try and play the franchise tag game next year, you've seen a guy who is willing to go and be a disgruntled employee and make this uncomfortable in the name of getting he wa- what he wants, so you'd just be courting that as the next phase of your operation. And then if you just look in a vacuum and ask, okay, is it smart for a team that's very good to invest a high amount of money at that one position? I still don't know the answer. Like, you were an offensive lineman, Mike, and you know, not that long ago, it was pretty well understood that a left tackle made substantially more than a guard made substantially more than a right tackle at times. And, you know, th- there were sort of tears to it. Now, I know there's been outliers and that's changed a little bit, but realistically, at some point, certain positions have to just accept that in today's NFL, they're not paid the same wild amounts of money. I think linebacker is becoming devalued in some ways in the NFL as well. Like there are certain positions that just are losing that value. And While we've blamed the individual player in the individual team, I think Jonathan Taylor will become a reminder that this is a league-wide issue that is not going to value running backs until they absolutely have to, which may be never at this point. There's a whole generation of kids in college that are going to make more with NIL than they would make being drafted in the fourth round and then playing out their rookie deals in the NFL. Yeah, it's and you mentioned the college portion of it. It's the right reminder of this is running backs are, as we've seen, at their physical peak and a lot of times at their productive peak on that first NFL contract when they're locked in and there's not much that they can do about it. And so that's the unfair economics. And I understand fair is a place where they judge pigs, but this is a bunch of decisions that did not have running backs in mind in the decision, but they've become collateral damage for rule changes over the years, CBA changes that have now landed us at this point. Saquon Barkley found out this same reality a few weeks ago. That's why to me, Jason, looking at this, this seems like a decision that has to be at least in part because of some of the hurt feelings with how the organization has publicly and maybe privately dealt with Jonathan Taylor here because I don't know how Jonathan could have looked out into the market of what had happened this offseason with Saquon, with Josh Jacobs, with Tony Pollard, on and on down the list, and seen a league that would be accommodating of what he wants here. This has also gotten so fractured, though, that the other side of it, Mike, is that the Colts are willing to let Jonathan Taylor explore, which to me is them saying, hey, you're going to find out there's nothing better out there. They better be confident in that because – Anthony Richardson, I mean, the knock on Anthony Richardson, as you and I both know, is that he needs more reps. He needs time. He needs to get better. I would think having a world-class running back around him would help, but the team simply can't keep the player around if he doesn't want to be there to the point that they'll be a detriment to their rookie quarterback and his development if they let him go, and they're willing to explore that. That tells you how fractured the relationship has become. And that, I think, is the biggest mistake in all this. We can quibble about running back market value and the big-time contracts out there, but you're also somewhat of, uh, you know, beholden to your team situation. And you mentioned it. You're Indianapolis, and you got a rookie quarterback who's going to need a stable situation around him. You're trying to rebound off last year's poor performance on the offensive line and running back front. Why would you want to tick off a guy that's still a really talented player who could help you out and bridge to the world where your quarterback is the overwhelming strength of your team? I thought it was a mistake for Saquon Barkley in New York not to get something a little bit more long-term done. And I think for the Colts, it could prove that for that same reason here as they try and get the best out of Anthony Richardson that they just invested in. All right, very excited as we march towards the start of college football season to talk to UCLA head football coach Chip Kelly with us now. Coach, in the middle of training camp, how are you holding up here? Have the days all started to blend together for you two? No. I mean, we, this is the fun part for us. So we, we, uh, we'll never not, I'll never get tired of this right now. This is awesome. So we're, uh, we're right in the middle of it. Our guys have been working their tails off, just get off the field this morning, um, getting ready for our meetings this afternoon and, um, getting ready to go. We got about one more week here of prep and then we're in the game week. So that's, that's kind of where we're, we're, we're kind of chomping at the bit as we talked about a little bit earlier. It's, it's right around the corner. You can, you can kind of, if you pick your head up high enough, I think you can see it. 
Oh, and, and everybody's so happy to be seeing it's the, the morning day, uh, the day after the Super Bowl. And then uh, we start up all again where high school is going, college getting ready to go. When when do you kind of get that excitement and that adrenaline going before it all starts? How, how, how long does it take? I think for us, it's that first day of um, preseason camp. So for us, August 2nd, because we have not been with our players since really the spring. I mean, we have been around and we'll, we'll come out and watch them run with the strength and conditioning guys and lift and all that. But the, the first time you get to see the ball going and the first time you get on the field and um, even the players, they, they miss football. You know, they, they trained extremely hard over in the off season, but um, I've always said this, the best part of football is football. So <laughs> when you get to finally go back and play football, not run and lift and, do all the things that prepares for it, but to actually get on the field and take a snap and run a play, it, it, that's that's when I, I'll, the juices get going again. Well, and coach, for you, the juice is getting going this year in a little bit of a different way in your time at UCLA here now. First training camp opening up without DTR running at quarterback yeah. for you here. Are you having like a, like a little bit of jealousy here watching him make plays for another team now in preseason football? I'm really happy for him, and it, it's a huge adjustment for our school because I, I think it's the first time since George Bush was president that Dorian <laughs> Tom Robinson will not be taking a snap. And that's George H.W. Bush, it seems like. So he, was, he was here for so long. Um, but what people are seeing right now in the NFL is what we saw here every day. You know, I've texted him and chatted with him, and we told him, without you cannot block. You're not supposed to be hitting people. Um, <laughs> But I also feel a little bit, maybe it wasn't just me that he didn't listen to, because I know Coach Stefanski is telling him to not hit people in the NFL, but he's such a competitor that I don't think he thinks sometimes. He just he just wants to be successful. And uh, But it's what makes him great. He's just a, he's an amazing competitor, and he's fun to watch, and I'm happy with the success he's having right now. Yeah, and, and are you – I don't imagine, I guess you would, because you saw him all that much, but he certainly wasn't one of the first quarterbacks going late around draft pick. Are you surprised at all at the early success he's having? I'm not surprised because of how hard he works at it um, and his competitiveness, you know, and as you guys know, you know, Mike, from playing in it, you know, sometimes you can't quantify that when it comes to a draft grade, you know, is how competitive a person is. And then all of a sudden, you get him out there and you're like, holy smokes. It, the one thing with Dorian is football is extremely important to him and he puts his heart and soul in everything he does. So um, it, it, I'm not surprised by it. Um, and, and the big thing, and we discussed it, is it, it doesn't matter when you get picked. It's, it's, it's not about work, when you get picked. It's about making it. And, and, the, and I've always known he was going to make it no matter who picked him. Coach, is there like a moment in a practice you remember like to the point of having to kind of pull back the reins on him sometime where you really had to grab him and stop him from taking it a little bit too far because of that competitive edge? Probably every other day. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it was that tight. It would be like there was, I mean, even in our bowl game, he got a personal foul early against Pitt. And then I think he tried to headbutt somebody later. And I just had to tell him, I was like, you don't want the last game of your career. Where you... And it's never happened to have a quarterback get two personal foul penalties and get kicked out of the game. So then he just, but he's so competitive. He'll snap right out. I got I, my bad. I'm losing. I'm, I'm good. And he, he can get, he can get grounded in a second. So, um, but it's just his competitive nature and it's what makes him him. So um, he'll continue to do that. He's a fiery, he's a fiery guy. And he was, a, he was a lot of fun to coach. Yeah, I'm sure uh, he may learn to tweak it a little bit. Guys in the NFL will certainly let you yeah. know with some hits. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll learn Trust some me, things. He, 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 if he throws a block on somebody, it may be the wrong person, as yeah. you know, Mike. <laughs> yes. He is, may learn a little quicker at that, that level. That is so true. So your team here, you have, you know, outside of a young quarterback coming in early in role, other quarterbacks there, you have a kind of a plethora of them. What's mm -hmm. your philosophy on that as far as when do you want to get that starter and give them the most time getting most of the reps before that season gets gets going? Well, we, we get a lot of reps in practice, so we're not overly concerned about that now. But as we get, we got about one more week here. And then as we get to game week, you know, we want to know who the, who's running with the ones and who's running with the twos. You know, so we got about four or five more days here and then, um, hopefully we'll get a little bit more clarity on it. But the, the good 
I think the good thing for all of us is it's not been easy because everybody's been playing at a really, really high level. Um, I think one of the things about having Dorian and Dorian playing so early, um, it made it somewhat difficult to recruit because everybody knew who the starter was, you know, and now um, we've got a young freshman who's a good player, Ethan Garbers, who's a returner that's played in games for us and been really successful for us, um, is back. And then we took a transfer, Colin Schley from Kent State, who's played a lot of football. And all of those guys have, have really played at a really high level here in, in preseason. So um, it's, it's a good problem to have. Uh, having depth at quarterback is a good problem. Absolutely. And you mentioned recruiting, a huge win, obviously, for you guys to get Dante over on campus there. One of the most highly touted recruits at that position. You mentioned a lot of these guys have played really well, but what stands out about his game as a young guy coming in in his first camp? I think his maturity. You know, he got here in January. Um, so he was an early enrollee, which was beneficial for him. Um, he seamlessly transitioned right into our team. I think he fit in really well with the culture that we have here. Um, but he he's mature beyond his age. Um, he's really kind of an old soul. And he, he you know, you almost feel like, it, I, I can't believe he's a true freshman still. You know, he hasn't played in a college football game because he seems like um, he's very non, he, he's very steady. And he doesn't, there aren't highs, there aren't lows. And, um, you know, he'll throw a spectacular pass, but he's not, not you know, he, he, I think he expects himself to throw that. Um, and, but if he, if he makes a mistake, it doesn't, he's on to the next play again also. You know, he's like, he's really got that next play mentality. He's, he's got the right makeup um, to play early if, if, if it ends up being him. Um, Cause I don't think he's going to be overwhelmed by any situation that he's been, cause he hasn't been overwhelmed by anything he's been put in so far. And, and uh, he's really been just a real, real mature young man. Which is amazing. He's 17 years old when he stepped on campus. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that, that, that's just a stunning thing. You know, not only he's coming in obviously as a recruit, but we know what the portal now has done in college football. So you, you've gotten a number of transfers this year. Kind of talk about that because it's over the years, it's something a little more new where you had to bit, rebuild sometimes through recruiting. Now you can kind of do it instantly, and it's just a matter of how quickly those guys can grasp the playbook coming from all different colleges. Yeah, I think it's the real challenge for all of us at the college level is um, you are allowed to transfer um, and are immediately eligible. Um, so really – what was last year's team is totally different than this year's team. You know, and I think it's just how quickly the whole group comes together. Um, and this group has done a really, really good job of that. You know, I think that it's a really connected group. Um, you know, we, we've been very conscious in what we do with them, not only in our training sessions, but what we do off the field with them of making sure our guys really understand who their teammates are and what that's all about. Um, Cause it can kind of be a little bit of a, a mercenary type situation where guys are just kind of there for six months and moving on and, and, and not part of it. Um, so we're, tr we try to make it, you know, really a team atmosphere. And I think our players appreciate that we've, we've kind of structured it that way. Um, and so this team is as close as any team as we've had here, even though they haven't been together as long as some of the teams that we've had here. And, um, and it's unique for us to be able to say that because I thought our COVID teams were really close because, you know, we basically spent 18 months here where we were the only people on campus, you know, and we had to become close because there was nobody else here. Um, now this team, I think, you know, genuinely spends a lot of time with each other, is very, very tight um, as a group. Um, and that's the big thing. You know, it's 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 coming together as a team, and I really think this group has really come together, um, even though there's a lot of kind of new faces and some moving parts. But I think they know that, so they've been conscious of trying to make sure that they all get connected at the same time too. Coach, you mentioned some of the things you do off the field to get that bond, to help the players all get to know each other and get that close. You've always been known, though, off the field for your approach to sports science, sports performance, looking for that edge and how you guys train. I'm curious, though, on the field, too, it seems like your offense has changed a lot since the last time we saw you in college football. What we've seen the last few years from you guys on offense, especially, wasn't just cookie cutter and the stuff from Oregon. So how have you changed, you know, from your last time in college football all those years back ago at Oregon to now being back here in your tenure at UCLA and how you approach this? Yeah, and, and we have changed. You know, I've always joked that when I left in 12 to go to the NFL, we were the only team that played fast and had shiny helmets and when i came back in 18 everybody played fast and everybody had shiny helmets um 
I think we're more personnel driven. Um, we were fortunate when we got here and it's continued that we have a lot of tight ends. Um, so we're similar to what we did when I was in the NFL and my first stint in Philly, we had Brent Selleck and Zach Ertz. We were a lot more in 12 personnel than we ever were at the, when I was at Oregon. And that's kind of carried over when we got here be, just because the, maybe it's California. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but we, we've had a lot of really good tight ends, you know, and, and Greg Dulcich got drafted in the third round by Denver. Devin Asiasi um, was drafted by the Patriots. He's playing for Cincinnati now. Caleb Wilson, we, every tight end that we've had since we've been here has been drafted. Um, and we've got a couple kids on this team that will get drafted. So I think we're more um, 11, 12, and 13 oriented from a personnel standpoint, just because it's what we have, you know, and it's not, that wasn't by design, um, but it's, you know, it's something that I think at times, um, as everybody's gotten smaller on defense to match these spread offenses, um, when you can be a multiple tight end team, I think you can present some problems to some defenses. So we have evolved a little bit like that. And I think a lot of the things that we learned when we were in the NFL about the situational matchup things, you know, if you're going to play with a small nickel and we have a six foot six, 260 pound tight end, well, then that's a mismatch, you know, and then are, are we going to force you to play, you know, with a bigger linebacker, but that may be not something that they, they normally do. So you're taking the defense a little bit out of their comfort zone because um, they're trying to match what you do. Being the former defensive player here, I have to ask about the defensive side of the ball, where the athletes yeah. are, as I like to say. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're returning a lot of starters, but those last five games, including the bowl game, you saw giving up some points and a quick drive against Pitt to that game-winning field goal. So what what is the difference, if anything, this year from a tactical or an X's and O's standpoint, or is it just execution by the players? Yeah, I think it's both. You know, I, obviously we've ch we've changed a little bit. Um, we lost our defensive corner, Billy McGovern. He passed away in the offseason. And um, we brought in Danton Lynn. Uh, Danton came in from the NFL. He's with the Ravens, uh, with John Harbaugh. And Danton's done a, a great job, you know, taking what we did really well last year and then really adding to it in terms of what his scheme is. Um, so we, we really are excited about what Danton brings to us defensively. And then um, – we have a lot of players back that have experience. We got probably nine starters back on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and, and they've all really grown. You know, Leati Latu is an outside linebacker for us who um, last year was his first year as a transfer. And he had sat out a year for a medical. So um, he was just kind of knocking the rust off and getting going. He's had an unbelievable off season and has really, really stepped his game up. And I think all of our players just watching him since the 2nd of August is have really, really improved. Um, their bodies physically. Um, I think they're a year older, they're a year mature. Um, and I, I really think going into the season that our, our defense um, is going to really be the backbone of this football team. And I'm excited to see them play. Uh, it's going to be exciting. I mean, you guys are one of many teams in this conference right now that walk into the season with really incredible rosters. And it should be a highly competitive league. And coach, it's one you've been a part of at multiple stops now. So I'm curious, big picture. Everyone knows the stories this offseason have been about who's departing. You guys are one of the teams that are getting ready to become uh, members of a new conference starting next year. As someone who has been involved in the Pac-12 for so long, how have you felt just kind of watching you know, this conference really in its last days at this point. Yeah, sad. I mean, the, there's such a history and tradition of this league. And, you know, a lot of my fondest experiences as a coach are in this league. And, and, and um, it's just hard to actually really fathom that there's four teams left right now. And, and uh, it's probably what's wrong with college athletics right now is, is I understand it. And I understand why we were, and we probably were the, the impetus for it when it all started because we were the first us and Southern Cal were the first teams to leave. Um, but it's become a, a money driven thing and you're offered 75 million to play in this league. And if you stay, you get 30 or less in that league, you know, and I, I have friends in this conference and they all said the same thing. If we had gotten the same offer, we would have done it too. Um, but somebody just needs to get out in front and take this over. I've said it before, oh. you know, and, and I know you guys went there, and I'm not saying it because you went there, but you, I, I actually think it's the right thing. Like, you're independent in football, and you're in a conference for everything else, and I think we should all be independent in football. And I, I, I think the biggest issue is that the NCAA tries to keep – they want every sport to be the same, and we're not the same. You know, we play once a week, um, but travel for the other teams that are leaving to go to the Big Ten, 
Um, you know, if you're in women's softball or men's volleyball, like I, I don't know how you play a, a 30 game schedule if you're traveling all the time. You know, we'll, we'll play four away games. That's not a big deal for us. But um, I, I think, and I think the Knight Commission actually said it is that I think football should be separate and not in a conference. It should be in one conference, and the 64 Power Five teams should be together. Uh, you can make eight division teams use the NFL model. You know, there's there's eight division teams in it. Play seven in your conference, and then play crossover games against a whole division every year, and just make sure that rotates. And I think you'd have some great out of out of out of division games. But um, I, it it's just sad that when you think of the history and tradition of this league, that a year from now there's not even going to be. I mean, I don't think anybody ever fathomed that that there's not even going to be a a Pac-10 or a Pac-12. That's you know that's that's going to be hard. And and I feel for really. You know, I have a good friend. Justin Wilcox is a good friend. Jonathan Smith is a good friend. You know, those guys, and by no fault of their own, you know, that, that they're scrambling to find a home to play football, and that's that's not what's, that's not right. It, it's a horrible situation, and you you said it. There's no leadership. We've talked about it, just no leadership to oversee it, and everybody's grabbing mm -hmm. the money right now and not thinking about the Olympic sports because it is going to be a horrific travel for them and that's the best idea i've heard too is separate football let the uh, let the other sports stay in their conferences travels travel is easier but somebody's going to have to take charge and do that and unfortunately uh we don't have that as far as and, and you're listen you've been around your coach you see things you're you're coaching your team and and that's the that's what you're concentrating on you have 18 to 23 year old players how do you how what, what have they said about it and how do you deal with knowing this is the last year of the Pac-12 to them because they're on social media all the time and reading everything. So how do you, how do you deal with them with that? I don't, I don't think they're as nostalgic as we are. Um, and then one thing we've tried to get them, we always talk about being the most prepared and the least distracted is that we have a schedule this year, um, you know, and it is to, to try to win the Pac-12 conference and, you know, and represent our league and, and after that. Um, so, you know, it's like when this first happened, a year ago and they called and said, Hey, we're, we're going to have a vote here real quick to go to the big 10. And then I was like, all right. And, you know, I said, well, when is that going to happen? And they said in two years. And I was like, all right, talk to me in two years. You know, my, 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 our goal, <laughs> our goal then was Dorian was going to be a senior. John Gaines was a senior. Neil Maffey was a senior. Jake Boba was a senior. You know, how do we make last season special for those guys? And it's the same thing with this group, you know, um, Miatu, Latu, Darius, Marsu, all those guys are going to be seniors and they're not going to be here when we play in the Big Ten. So we don't really talk about the move to the Big Ten. We'll talk about the move to the Big Ten when we make the move to the Big Ten, and that'll be after this season. So um, right now, this, the, the current players on our team and, and this season is our priority, and I think they're focused on that. You know, and it's – is it maybe when, if you get a chance and you get a chance to compete for the championship, that's a little bit historical that you could be the last Pac-12 champ. Um, but – it's still about playing football and, and sharing this experience with your teammates. Couldn't have said a better coach. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, I think, what we're all in it for at the, the core of this and excited it's around the corner. Uh, we appreciate the time, Coach. Before we let you go, I do have to ask, though, because I saw this come out the other day. Brett McMurphy put out the list of every Pac-12 head coach's favorite musical artist here. You big live concert guy. How many times have we seen Mumford and Sons? Have you been able to meet them with your status as a head coach in college in the NFL here? What was the story there? Um, the, the number of times I've seen them in concert is zero. Oh, I've never, I've seen two bands in concert in my life. And that was uh, Kenny Chesney and the Zach Brown band and they were both unbelievable experiences and I got a chance to be on stage so that after, for the Kenny Chesney concert so that kind of set the bar for me so if I'm not going to be on stage <laughs> with the lead center then I'm not going you know I know everybody was excited about Taylor Swift and she played at SoFi the other day but I did not get an invitation to be on stage with her so I did not go to that concert either um so I, I got a pretty high bar when it comes to uh when it comes to it, but um, I do like what they are. And it was one of those, you've been to the, the media days and whatever, and Brett's awesome. You know, who's your favorite band? And I went, I'm Mumford or something, and moved on. Didn't think anything else of it. I didn't know it was something that he published or talked about or or what it was. It's actually funny when you, you get a chance to, to read them and listen to them. But I, there was not, I do like them, but I, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of thought put into my answer when, when I gave that answer. 
And, and boy, but and you're right. I mean, it's like it's like getting guides at a at Disney World. Once you get to back door of the rides, yeah, you never yeah. want to go stand in line again. So once you go back no. stage with Kenny or on on stage, you're right. It ruins it. You never want to do it. Am I on stage? Then no. <laughs> And you get that, hey, you want to go to this concert? I was like, are we like backstage and we're hanging out with the lead singer? They're like, what are you talking about? And I have a picture. I'm like, I'm talking about this. And they're like, no, not at all. I'm good. I'll just. <laughs> All right, well, you know what? There we go. Challenge uh, thrown down for Mumford & Sons here. You really want <laughs> yeah. to cement the bond with Chip <laughs> Kelly. You get him on stage and you let him sing with you guys here. Uh, Coach. Uh, sure. go. They're, they're, they're probably saying, who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about after this year coach can't thank you enough for all the time best of luck with the end of camp here and the start of the season we're looking forward to it all right guys mike be safe in ireland oh i will thanks coach guinness will help me through <laughs> see ya all right before we get to this that and the third three quick stories to finish off the day as always download subscribe rate review i i can't help but share as we're sitting we had taped that interview with chip kelly me and dad had recorded it obviously he's not here today and jason fitz is just sitting there again for former member of the band perry just sitting up here going what is it like cool to be on stage with the singers i had no idea uh way cooler to me my first ever national championship game in college football. Better memory because I was standing next to Mike and we didn't know the confetti cannons were right behind us. They went off. I think I peed myself a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. But but I guess, you know, it's cool to be on stage with the lead singer. I mean, sure. Uh, if that's your thing. If you're into that kind of stuff. And I can confirm Jason Fitz did have pee pants on the sidelines of that game next to the confetti, confetti cannon. And I saw it coming the whole way and I didn't say anything because I'm a monster and I wanted to watch it all play out. So... Uh, we all need things Thank to entertain you, us at different points. And uh, <laughs> that is what we're going to try and do here. Let's start off with this. Um, Jason, this was Stephen A. Smith, uh, co or host of First Take, yesterday sneaking in an interesting little nugget as they were discussing the New York Jets and the AFC East about what he believes is the case with star Buffalo Bills wide receiver Stephon Diggs. So you got Stephon Diggs, this brother all-world receiver, but clearly wasn't happy, walked out, didn't want to talk to nobody. They came into training camp. They had some friction. They had to get settled and all of this other stuff. Brother wants out, by the way. I'm just telling you what I know. I got my own sources. Brother wants out. He don't want to be in Buffalo anymore. You know what? I'm telling you right now, I have my sources. Stephon Diggs got to be there, but he would prefer to be gone because he's lost a level of belief in the Buffalo Bill. That's right, I said it. It's Stephen A, baby. I'm not, I'm telling you what I know. Okay, you they, they can don't deny, they can tell you what they want. I have my sources. I'm telling you what I know. All right. I appreciate him tagging that take like a DJ drop or an old person signing a text message. Uh, but Jason, Stefan Diggs came out and tweeted a denial of this, said 100% not true. I don't know who the source is, but I thought I nipped this in the bud. Uh, Jason, you buying any of the holdover drama? We know they started camp with a little bit of Diggs and Josh Allen. It would seem drama. Do you think that actually matters still at this point? I don't think it matters today, but by the end of the year, if there's a spell where he's not getting the ball or there's some sort of an uncomfortable moment, I think it could matter. It goes back to what we all said when they first started talking about this when he came back, and that was, you know, Stefan Diggs and the coaches and Josh Allen all kind of said, well, we hadn't talked since the end of the regular season. Mike, that just seems weird to me. When you've got a superstar wide receiver that you know isn't pleased with the way the season ended, and then you've got a coach and a quarterback that say they haven't talked to him in months, that just seems unusual to me. Like, you know a locker room better than I do, but certainly it seems like if you know your star wide receiver is a little disgruntled, maybe you fly out to wherever they are and have a little, you know, you break bread and you try and smooth things over. So I think that's just stuck still in people's heads. But, uh, I mean, I'm not, not here to doubt Stephen A., but, boy, I'll take Stephon Diggs' word for it over Stephen A.'s. Yeah, at this point, I would too. I think he's going to get the ball plenty this year. I mean, hell, last year statistically was, I think, his second best season in his career, only behind the 2020 season. So he still got the ball plenty. He had more receiving touchdowns than he had in any season in his career. And, oh, by the way, the Buffalo Bills are still really good. Just because they keep losing at certain junctures to the Chiefs or to the Bengals does not make them a bad football team, but they definitely need to get this done now because some parts on defense are starting to get a little bit old. So I don't think this is going to be any issue now, but we know after this offseason, everybody is going to be watching every interaction between Josh and between Stefan going into every game. So we'll see if the secret handshakes persist. Um, Jason, let's get to that. We got college football week zero coming up. Uh, we will probably talk a lot about that as the week goes along, but more college football news yesterday is Michigan 
self-imposes a three-game suspension for head football coach Jim Harbaugh in the wake of what the NCAA doesn't says, uh, say is about burgers, but what we know is about lying about giving recruits burgers at a time deemed impermissible by the NCAA. Uh, Jason, they're trying to do this, uh, no doubt, to see if they can curb whatever penalty might come since the negotiation between Michigan and the NCAA kind of seemed it was on the rocks a little bit ago. Do you think it works suspending Jim Harbaugh for the daunting slate that includes UNLV amongst others before they get to Big Ten play? Wow, you had to throw the UNLV shade in there. By the way, UNLV on the rise. Let's go. Uh, Now, do I think it works? No. Do I think it gives them a legal leg to stand on if this gets to a situation where they decide they want to go a legal route with the NCAA? Yes. I think this is Michigan basically saying, fine, you don't have to agree to our punishment. We're going to do this anyway because we think this is what's right. And that way, when we need to challenge you, we can challenge you on the grounds of we did what we thought was appropriate. So I think this is more about so much of life preparing for the lawsuit than it is about actually trying to. Plus, it's Michigan admitting, by the way, that they got three games on their schedule they don't even need their coach for. Like, let's just be honest. They're like, yeah, we got those three. We're fine on that one. And by the way, he can still coach during the week that week and just not on game day. And so it's great experience for one of the Michigan assistants that would get to step up and be the head coach on game day. You get all that practice in for, again, the slate that includes East Carolina week one, UNLV week two, Bowling Green week three, all at home in Ann Arbor. Like they have said, oh yeah, you know, we'll we'll go ahead and take care of this. It's okay. And then gave themselves the easiest thing possible here. Uh, Bre- uh, listen, Jason, as someone whose school once tried to cooperate with the NCAA during an investigation and still saw all 12 of their wins taken from their final year in South Bend, I can assure you cooperation has not always been incentivized. And that is the one thing about this entire ordeal is it is about Michigan's lack of cooperation in the investigation. That is what made this a tier one violation and is now getting them on the cusp of being suspended or having their head coach suspended. What the NCAA has always done a bad job is incentivizing cooperation and yet they complain about it publicly and try and punish it on the back end so never cooperate with them is my message mike though you just came up with the best idea in college football history let the committee that doesn't do anything until playoff time let the committee early in the year look at your schedule and then decide which games are cupcakes and on those cupcake games they can decide which member of your coaching staff has to coach the game now we're going to make cupcakes interesting and get people experience and people will hate the committee even more i love this drama Uh, Listen, Jason, I want to be abundantly clear. Cupcakes are always interesting, and we don't need to do anything else to make (laughs) cupcakes interesting. That is a fact. Uh, (laughs) All right, uh, Jason, let's get to the third and away from cupcakes because I am already way too hungry at this point here. Uh, Pretty cool, I mean, full-scale story of... I won't call it a comeback, but it certainly feels like that. Everyone remembers a couple of years ago in Olympic trial, Shakari Richardson became one of the lightning rod stories in the world of sports uh, at Olympic time trials in Oregon, going out there, blazing her road to Tokyo before ultimately being taken down by a positive marijuana test, which in the world of track and field was treated as a performance enhancer and all ignited this furious debate about her as a person, as a proxy for that conversation in the world of sports. Well, fast forward, Jason, to Monday night, and the 23-year-old took home a gold medal at the World Championships in a gigantic 100-meter race alongside of plenty of the Olympics. Her 10-6-5 victory over uh, Jamaica's Sharika Jackson and five-time champion Shelly Ann Frazier-Price capped a massive comeback for her. I don't know if you saw the race footage. It was really compelling. She had to run from the outside because of how she placed in trials and semifinals, which is the inherently more difficult place to try and run and gauge your opponents and still managed to get the result that she was looking for. So very cool to see someone who two years ago seemed to be going through it every which way and having to deal with everyone having an opinion on them, finally getting to go out there and just cut it loose. And and change, at least, I, I won't say change, but at least redirect some of the narrative. Because you're right, the conversation became so overwhelming about one thing for her that along the way, I think we forgot the greatness that she is capable of, right? And so to come into that race and have that level of, of a success, you mentioned the Jamaican runners, one of them actually in the footage covering her mouth said, it's been forever since USA won a gold medal. And she immediately responded, because of you, like this was a huge win, right? So 
uh, you think about what it means for the country, but also what it means for her as an individual. And maybe it just changes some of the conversation that we need to stop having about her, frankly, in my opinion, and just let her be the great athlete she is. So I, I'm, I'm proud of her for having this this moment. You're right. It may be not redemption, but it's conversation changing. And that's that's the important thing. And, and just great to see her get to enjoy being back out there and being a part of these big moments. Uh, she said and recited what she has all along. I'm not back. I'm better. And, uh, boy, we could all take a little bit of that medicine. We hope you thought we were back and better. Thank you to Jason Fitz for hanging out with us today. We'll be back tomorrow. Go, go. Boom. Money in the bank.